So I'm going to welcome all of our, our attendees at home, maybe in the comfort of their homes. Um, my name is Jessica Marsalek, and I'm a social worker with HDSA. I um, am the Minnesota chapter social worker and have been working with HD families for the last 16 years. I'm also the Midwest youth social worker. So I want to welcome you here today um, from home and for any of those that decide to join us in person. Right now we are all, um, all of our attendees are virtual. So we are going to try to engage with you as best we can in this format, okay? Um, if you could take a moment and in the Q&A, if you are on the app and you're able to go into the Q&A portion, um, if we could just start by maybe putting a question or a topic that you would like to, you came here today to learn about. That way, uh, we're going to be talking about a lot of different resources, but that would give me some knowledge about what we, maybe I should delve into deeper or we could discuss any further. So if you're at home and you can put in the question and answer chat, um, something that you would like to learn about or you have a question, that would be great. Did you come here looking for any resource or anything in particular? I came to learn about JHD. Wonderful. Wonderful. Do you know someone that has JHD? I do not. Okay. I just want to learn more. Yes. Very cool. Very cool. Um, so we'll just wait to see if there's any um, questions and answers. As If you want to put that in during our time, that's fine. I have Christine here who is helping me um, monitor that. We can just get started. I do have a handout here, so if you want to pick up a handout, um, I'm going to go through these, these items. Um, okay, so we're going to be going over JHD resources today. Um, not, we're going to be talking about financial, supportive, and educational resources as related to juvenile Huntington's disease. Um, and so as we get, go through this, it's really going to be JHD focused. Um, but not all the resources are just for juvenile HD, but these are things to be considered of and to know of um, when having a young person in your life that has juvenile HD. Again, I'm Jessica Marsalek. Um, if you have any questions um, now or um, in the future, feel free to reach out to me, jmarsalek at hdsa.org, or my phone number that I do answer is 612 371 0904, so please feel free to reach out anytime. Um, this is a disclaimer from HDSA. Mm -mm. Okay, so we'll start with school. I am a school social worker um, in my full-time job, and so um, that is something that I thought we should talk about. Um, more in depth, um, as usually our juvenile HD um, loved ones are in school, and um, at some point uh, will need what's called a 504 plan or an IEP to individualize their school plan. Um, some of these terms are really foreign in the educational world. We're really used to those terms, um, but to anyone else outside of our our scope, is it's a lot of jargon. Um, so a 504 plan is. Um, for a child that has a disability, any medical, um, mental health diagnosis or medical diagnosis, any child can get what's called a 504 plan. And what that is is where you as a family, as a student, and as an educational team, you come together and you talk about what accommodations the child needs to be successful in school. And from there, you come up with those accommodations, um, whether it be, it can be anything from um, needing a uh, sensory break or needing, it can, it's usually those um, things that are very easy to accommodate in a general ed classroom. It doesn't take extra staff generally, it's just things that the teacher knows to maybe position a student closer to the front or the student needs, um, I'm trying to think of just general things, but there, uh, it's an accommodation that once it's written up in this plan and agreed upon as a team, it's a legal binding document just as an IEP would be. But we usually, um, we sometimes will start with a 504 plan. Um, it's the least restrictive, um, and it's legally binding. So what the team decides, the school has to provide. Um, and if a child needs above and beyond services from a team, we look at an individual education plan. And so an IEP would be something that a child would be evaluated for. Now early on in JHD, a child might not qualify right away. Um, you want to make sure that um, the 
the needs are at the level and the child would qualify because there are there are criteria to get an IEP. It's not something that you can just say, yep, um, I want one, I get to have one. There's, there's specific criteria per um, the ed individual education plan and there's criteria that fall under different categories. And what JHD would fall under is what's called other health disabilities. So if a child has a medical um, or mental health um, ADHD or um, depression or a, a medical condition like JHD, they would fall under the criteria of other health disabilities. And so under that, um, we would need a, a letter signed from a doctor saying they have this diagnosis. And from there, the team would do assessments like they would for any child. And then the team, including the parents, um, and depending upon the age of the child as well, would come up with a plan that would be individualized to the student um, to again make sure that the child can access their education and what kind of services the child needs to be successful at school. Um, whether it's physical therapy, OT, speech, um, those different types of professionals in the school setting. Um, there's a lot of jargon and, and in the handout I provided today there is a, kind of a glossary of school jargon. Um, there's a resource called uh, PACER organization. It's a Minnesota-based organization, but the information in there is very general about IEPs and 504 plans, and they have a lot of the jargon explained for families in a glossary term. Um, so PACER Center, <coughs> excuse me, PACER Center is a place to go for that kind of information um, to explain what IEPs are and the laws around uh, special education. Uh, I want to just touch base on what Circle of Friends is. It's a, it's a disability inclusion um, conversation and curriculum that can be done if you have a child with a disability and they're in a general ed classroom and you try to explain to the classroom or their peers what their disability is in a way that is empathetic and um, informational. Oftentimes, if, you know, as, as humans, we're curious about what, uh, you know, what somebody might have if we know somebody's a little different. It's a, it's a way that um, a conversation can be facilitated with their, their peer group so that they can understand what the disability is, in this case, juvenile HD, and, <laughs> excuse me, why a student might behave a certain way or um, look a certain way or their mannerism, mannerisms might be different. So that's just a, a way um, to show. Can I get out of this and go to the websites that I'm referencing? Okay. Just want to make sure so I can show that on the screen. Okay, so I did pull up a couple of these websites just so that I'm not. So here's the circle of friends. It's, it talks about your circle of support friends. It's an inclusive um, curriculum that schools would do and facilitate. Sometimes a parent could be a part of those conversations, <coughs> especially with juvenile HD. The parent is oftentimes the expert in, in their child and what Huntington's is. So sometimes a parent could be included in that conversation with the, the classroom. Sometimes the child with the disability is a part of the conversation, part, sometimes not. Um, so Googling circle of friendship conversations is where you would find information about that. Pacer Center is a, a center for um, educating the community and parents about for children with disabilities. They have several publications about assistive technology, anything um, special education wise, there's just a ton of resources on there. And like I said, I, I think, it, I know it's based in Minnesota, but it's certainly um, not just Minnesota specific as far as the resources go. So I really like that organization. So, we are going to go back to the presentation. So we'll, we'll go non-technology for a moment. I hope everyone at home can still hear, and we'll just continue without me being able to show you the websites. I will just reference what we're talking about. We're going to improvise. Okay. So, question? Yeah. So this document that you have here is that available online for them as well? It isn't right now. No. Okay. No, but. If those of you online could please put your email address in the Q&A section, Christine and I can email you a copy of this resource. Um, I just printed it off in person so that people could jot down notes if they have any questions or 
and I'm that kind of person. So um, I'm happy to send that to you guys. So let's start out with some financial resources. Uh, we have Social Security Disability. Um, children under 18 that have a, um, a disability that is in the criteria of Social Security Disability, if um, a child is under 18 and has a disability that will last at least one year or um, could, may result in death, um, then a child could be eligible for Social Security Disability. That is something that um, you can work with your local county to get that started. I know some county human service agencies will walk a family through that process. It is a uh, probably a six month at least process to get all of the information and medical records to uh, make that determination, but um, for families, it can be a, a very helpful resource. Um, it also can be financially um, it can be determined by finan financial income of the family, of the household. So um, I, did ha I do have the Social Security website to share. There is a resource on the SSDI website that is called the SSI Child Disability Starter Kit for children under 18. And that website has, um, it says, there's a disability starter kit. It says step one, they want you to gather the information that is um, needed in order to apply for social security disability. Um, it tells you how to prepare and get ready. Um, it's a federal program, but each state, there's a state medical review team that will review all of the medical records and information to make a determination to see if the child does qualify. And so, um, we, it's called SMRTED, S-M-R-T, the State Medical Review Team. That is who will review um, to determine if a child um, can qualify for SS, SSI. Um, so learning the process by going on, this, on the, their website, looking at, the, um, looking at the process, looking at this worksheet um, is a great place to start. Also connecting with your local county. Some of the, the financial resources that um, are available really need to start with the county and just making sure that you have the um, get a social worker <laughs> get really really getting connected with your local county and and making sure you take down the name of who you talk to and um, having those personal local connections can be really helpful um, whether it's disability services in your home whether it's disability services um, outside of your home uh, modifications to your home these are the people that will be um, your, your biggest helper. So as we continue talking about financial resources, like I said, county resources, um, some of them are income-based, so it might depend on your family's resources and income. Um, there are programs that are able to look at just the child and not the family income, so that's why you really want to connect with your county social workers and talk about um, what options there are. Um, there are families that have done some fundraising and benefits. Um, for their families. Um, generally, it's somebody outside of your family that would start something like that, um, but there are families that have done um, GoFundMes for specific wheelchairs or things that aren't covered under insurance. That is something that people have done. I know um, we had a local family do a kickball tournament for their loved one, and so that would help support her care um, and anything she needed. So that's an option. And then there's also some nonprofits that do individual grants and funding. HGSA does not, but there are, are nonprofits that part of their mission is to provide some individual grant funding. Help for HD. Um, we have Champions for HD. Um, so there's a few that do offer the individual funding. Money doesn't grow on trees, but there are there are resources and and grants out there and. Um, opportunities to help. Emotional support. That is something that um, I think is really important, especially with the JHD community, since it is such a small community and a small group of children and families that are affected. It's that much more important to have those um, emotional supports because of the internet. It has opened up the world of being able to be connected and supported. Um, there are um, opportunities with HDO, with um, 
HDSA and with retreats and in-person options. With COVID, we've done a lot of virtual options. I put Caring Bridge up there. I know some families have utilized Caring Bridge. I don't know if any, anyone online or in person has utilized it as a way to um, connect your friends and family to where your, your child or loved one is at, but that's a great way for people to still stay connected. There's also something called Share the Care. It's a website where um, friends and family don't always know how to be supportive and how to be helpful, but you can put things on there that you might need assistance or help with, and friends and family can sign up to be that person to help. So it's called Share the Care. JHC Kids is a website of support. Uh, Facebook has multiple support groups. I know we have um, we have a sponsored support group through HDSA that has a JHD online support group every third Sunday at 7 p.m. through Support Group Central. I think London in the room has told me that she ha there's also a support group she helps facilitate. What's that through London? Uh, it's, uh, through Help for HD, and it's the yeah. first Help for H is through Help for HD. London facilitates a support group, the first and third, third Tuesday of each month. Okay, so caregiver support group. I have to repeat everything so it goes on. Sorry. Nope, I appreciate it. Um, it's for caregivers who specifically have a child with JHD, so it's very specific to that, and it's um, first and third Tuesday. Wonderful. Great. Great group, wonderful. If, you're also watching, <laughs> if you're watching, she loves you. <laughs> you have a question? Um, yeah, I don't know if we're doing questions or anything. So sorry. Anytime. It's Sunday night one for just the kids with JHD, or is that also caregivers? You know. I don't know. Okay. I. Question. So the question was: Is the JHD online support group that is through HDSA? Is that for kids with JHD or caregivers? And you know what? Matt, would you search my email and find that email? Because I, the facilitator of that group emailed me and gave me this information, so I want to make sure I clarify that for those listening. <laughs> because that's a great question. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. So HSA does have some very specific opportunities for people depending upon where they are within their roles as a, a family. Sometimes, um, you know, we have some overlap where people may have different roles, but at that time they may need support in one area. And so wherever you find yourself at that time. Um, but JHC is very specific to that group of people. So there are things that only caregivers and parents living in a family with JHD would understand. So that's very important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, London was saying that the, the best part of it is just being able to have that support and um, share resources and just share advice with each other that, you know, only only um, those being a parent or caregiver would understand. So, it's for families. I don't know if you want to read. It's got the information right there. So the inf information I was sharing about the third Sunday of the month at seven Eastern time, um, the JHD online support group is. Um, it says for JHD families. Um, it doesn't say if it's just for caregivers or just for children. It says families. So. Yeah, they might do breakout rooms. It maybe depends on who shows up. I know that's a possibility in the support groups I've facilitated is it kind of depends on who shows up. And so I'm guessing with this um, format that might be an option. So I'm gonna say family and then whoever shows up, hopefully it meets the needs of everyone there. Thank you for asking that question. Um, so, so there's, I mentioned some, some broader community um, options. There's also, I know um, some families have really found strength in their church communities or school communities and other volunteer organizations nearby. Sometimes those county social workers that you do connect with are aware of some resources that you may not know. 
Um, we have a, a really cool local program that will match a volunteer with a family with somebody that has a disability and they will do such things as just spend time with the family member so that the, the caregiver can go out and run errands or like have a weekly relationship like where they would um, support the, the family by being that care partner. Not so much doing hands-on care, but being a friend to the family. And so there's some really neat resources that you wouldn't know about unless maybe you talk to your social workers in the county because they, they tend to know a lot of stuff. Um, but every, every, every area is different. Some metro areas are really robust with resources and some smaller towns don't have as much. So there are some benefits to being in a larger city sometimes with transportation or um, any type of resource really. Unfortunately, some of our more remote areas have less resource in that regard, but it's good to connect with your local county to learn of that. HGSA has um, eight free counseling sessions each year um, through telehealth, and that's something that I don't, I repeat probably a few times a year to my groups and to my families because it's, it's a really neat resource. You don't always need it when you hear of it the first time, but just to remind families that, that um, there are trained counselors that are trained in HD um, through HDSA that are available for eight free sessions a year for families, and that's through HDSA's website. Here. HGSA also has some publications that are of value. Um, oftentimes, not just, well, with HD in general, you are oftentimes the expert and the one that has to be educating your community, sometimes your professionals, sometimes your providers about what Huntington's is. With JHD, it's even more specific to that. So, um, whether it's your school having um, I'll just pull up some of the resources that HGSA has. I, I think it's always helpful to have these resources on hand so that when you're educating others, you have something that you can leave with. So, sorry, there's, there is a HGSA Juvenile HD Handbook, which is a guide for families and caregivers. Those resources aren't just for families and caregivers. I think they're also educational for other people. So if you bring them with you to your provider um, and use it as an educational tool, you can flip to certain pages and talk about different topics. And not, not that you don't know it, but it validates you and your information. It doesn't, it makes the provider think more professionally of what you're sharing and validates it. So it just reinforces what you're sharing. There's also a family guide, which is a smaller pamphlet I brought in today. Um, all of these resources on HGSA are free to download. They're not all cover to cover reads, but they are of value. I don't know why the internet's not working so great to show pictures, but there's a couple. Uh, here's the Juvenile HD and the School Experience. It's an educational guide for, for those working with students in school with Juvenile HD. And so it's a spiral bound book that can be sent out to a, a school team. And then it's not just the family sharing the, the information, it's from a doctor. It's um, Dr. Martha Nance, who's, whose specialty is in juvenile HD as well. So it's, um, it goes through more of a school-based um, considerations to, for the school team, and it's in their jargon. So those are some resources I think are really important to know of and to maybe have on hand. The juvenile handbook, like I said, is just another um, free to download, but you can get copies. There was a few handouts here at convention that were free, but you can get them for a small amount to be sent to you. Um, sometimes when I when schools reach out to me or care providers reach out, I can just link these publications really easily and say, "Hey, um, check out this page on this on this guide." Um, I think there's just really good resources linked in there. So. I'm using those to your benefit. There's a lot more than there used to be. <laughs> um, the HDO website has some really great information. There's a JHD section. Very informational, very um, helpful for young people as well as others that are trying to learn about juvenile HD. Are there anyone, is there anyone online that wrote anything that they would like to delve in deeper or what they came here for to talk about. Can I ask anybody in the audience if there's anything you came here to maybe delve into further? Yeah. 
Well, I didn't come for this, but I'm just curious on the first page where it says make relationships with local police and law enforcement. Yeah. I'm curious, like, what the motivation is for that. Yeah, so HD or JHD alike, you, it's really, it's very advantageous to befriend and to educate really anyone you meet, but um, in a community to um, work with your local law enforcement that may be first responders if you have a medical emergency or a mental health emergency. Um, I always recommend that you make those proactive connections ahead of time. And HDSA um, and Help for HD also have really great tools to do that conversation, really. Um, HDSA has a, a toolkit that you can, you can share information about HD, but then there's also a specific um, form that you can fill out and put a picture of your loved one. You can write down some information that um, talks about just general HD, but then you can make it really specific to your loved one and say, um, in a crisis situation, my loved one may have increased movements, may be more anxious, and may um, appear to be intoxicated or may appear to be so you can explain to them ahead of time and provide some of that proactive education. Um, we've had opportunities where we've seen police by our support group. We've invited them in. Come on in. We, you know, any, anyone you talk to if that has, most people don't understand it. So any person you talk to and can educate, um, there may be times where you have to call um, for medical support, whether it be a seizure or uh, a first aid crisis, you have to call. And so... Um, just having that knowledge ahead of time. Um, and even if it is a mental health crisis, labeling it a mental health crisis, if there's um, any safety issues with that, um, they're gonna approach you a lot more calm and kindly and empathetically than if um, they don't have that knowledge. So. Can I, can I add that? Yeah, please. So we want to help, help for HD, not to keep, but, but they mm -hmm. do have a wonderful law enforcement education mm -hmm. program as a free program. Um, you can just contact Vicki Owen. It's just Vicki at HelpForHD.org. And literally, it's a like a whole class on a flash drive to take to your police department to teach local law enforcement about the disease. Not even just for juvenile specifically, but just, you know, so you don't have a situation where I'm not drunk. I have Huntington's in a sense. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Like, just so they understand a little bit more what it is. Plus, they get points. or I don't know how that works with cops. Yeah. But, uh, you know what I'm trying to say. Yeah, so... Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, so London was sharing a resource called um, with, through, Vic, through Help for HD that Vicki Owens will be able to share. And her, it's Vicki at help for, help for org. And there is a, a course that's provided through a flash drive or online that you can bring to your local uh, police or fire or EMT service um, to teach them. Every police department has an educational staff member that that's their job is to provide training and education to their um, their staff members and so approaching the local um, you know police station and saying can I speak to that person would probably be your first step um, there's a lot of it's not like you would maybe have a lot of time but whatever time they give you if they even allow you to talk to one or two people there and just to get anyone to or leave information whatever it may be <laughs> it's <laughs> Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can either leave it or if they're willing to listen, then being that spokesperson. HGSA also has cards that say I have Huntington's disease on them. Some people have um, f bracelets they wear. Um, a lot of people with HD get misunderstood, and, and it's all just miseducation. You know, it really is. Um, Having those cards, I've, I've, I don't know how many people in the 16 years I've worked with that have been pulled over and arrested for thinking they're having you know, public intoxication when they had, haven't had anything. Um, so just raising awareness, having those cards available or even a medical alert. I know some Apple watches and, phone, and phones will have the emergency where you can put in a diagnosis so they will look for that, wearing a necklace, whatever it may be to alert them. Uh, we all get more nervous when we're with, <laughs> in a crisis situation, or if a police officer were to approach us, any one of us would have, ha would have some anxiety going on, but throw HD in the mix, and you may see more movements. You may see more erratic behavior. Um, it can be very confusing for, for them, um, but 
just knowing that we can be proactive if we can, it helps. And there's some now, there's, not, there's great resources out there to help facilitate that conversation. Any other questions? No, thank you for sharing the resources. No, yeah, and resources. <laughs> and and there's a lot out there, more than there ever used to be. Yeah, yep. And and I don't plan. To, I don't mean that I'm the expert up here. I knew people in the audience and at home are probably much more experts than I am on <laughs> the topic. And that's the valuable part of getting together and being able to share those resources. So. Yeah, so the question was that uh, in a school system, who would be that person that would facilitate that kind of a conversation, like a circle of friends conversation, or who would maybe facilitate, maybe even initiating some of the, the talk about IEP or 504? Um, it all depends on the school. Uh, I am a school social worker in an elementary school. Um, I wouldn't say most schools have, always have counselors or social workers on staff. I am not special ed, I'm the entire school. So I'm very lucky to have that kind of opportunity where I, I would be the person in my school to do that, but not every school has that. Um, where I would start is asking to speak with the school, psycho school psychologist, social worker, or counselor. If they have one, great. Um, they should have one on staff because IEP teams usually have a school psychologist or a school social worker. Um, so that would be where to start, um, but that would be the role that would probably be facilitating that conversation if they have that on staff. Um, the IEP or the 504 plan would be initiated generally from a parent saying I'd like my child to be evaluated for a 504 plan or an IEP. And at that time the school would initiate it and you would sign paperwork saying you agree that you want your child evaluated and from there they would start assessing. But the parent is along the ride the whole time. They're an active part of the team. If they don't agree with the plan, the plan doesn't go through unless the parent and the whole team is on board with the rules the right plan. So it all depends where you live. <laughs> yep. These are so unfortunate. I know for people in my support group, it's unfortunate what some kids have to go through and the voice that you have to be for your child to get them to understand. That's why these resources are important too. Like you said, bringing all that stuff to the school. Mm -hmm. On the school, the nurse showed me the binder that she has on information about the disease. Not that she's reading it every day, but it's like this thick. It's a whole binder just for autumn. So it's there. And, yeah. Lena was just saying that it can be really unfortunate in some areas that, you know, some schools will have really an interest and want to learn more and be willing to put forth the effort. And, and she's learned that some areas it's not the same. And you also mentioned that you have to be your child's advocate. And absolutely, you, it's not always easy. And in certain areas, it's a lot harder. We're very mm -hmm. no one wants <laughs> <laughs> you have to be that mama bear. <laughs> you had a question back here. So oh, the question, real quick, the question was, um, you know, would you have a separate group of students that would would it be better to have them with other students that have other disabilities, or to be with other children? Is that kind of like the general, maybe with the general population versus maybe a smaller classroom with other kids with disabilities? Is that kind of what you were yes. asking? And Lennon was just sharing her personal experience. In my, in my opinion, I think it's really up to, it depends on the child. It depends on if the child, you know, some kids, no matter how far progressive they they might not feel comfortable being around other disabled kids. They might not even want to go to school. Um, I mean, what I, I, I look at it as whatever makes my child happy is what makes them happy. So if they're comfortable going to a disabled area and just being with those kids, so be it. If um, my daughter right now is comfortable going to school now, she has an IEP, she's, she's got a parent for every class, which is basically an assistant. Um, and she does sit like at the dis disabled, I don't, I don't know how, what to call it, you know, the disabled table at lunch and she loves the kids, but she still goes to a normal school setting. Yep. So I really just think it depends on the kid and how the kid's feeling. And, yeah, because you're talking about how challenging it was, and, you know, yeah. and I guess that also reflects on the child's environment, too, yes. in some ways. Mm -hmm. so and also, I think it's a really important thing to not have the kids stressed out. That was my main thing yeah. with when it comes to when Autumn was diagnosed. It's like, you know, she's going to school, sure, because she wants to, but she does not need to be stressed out over trying to get the right answers on tests. She doesn't need to be stressed out over trying to write her name correctly. I mean, 
she's just there to be there, and they thankfully understand that that she's there to be there for. That's that's anyway. And just just so she's, they just want her as comfortable as possible. So we're we're very lucky with our school. So in summary, London was sharing that it's very it depends on the child, um, but yeah, it depends on the child and. Um, and it also depends on the child's progression of the disease, so uh, their, their abilities and capabilities at that time. Um, children I've worked with, um, some have gone to school because they love the social aspect of it, they love being with their peers, they may not be able to be in the general classroom the entire time, and they may be a little boring for them at times, um, and they may have other activities they can do at school, but I think the socialization and the being able to be with their peers and having friendships um, when you take away that school opportunity, kids and adults, when they end that school time part of our life, we're, we don't have those natural relationships that we do when we're in school or in a working setting. So I know that part can be really isolating for, for kids. So for the quality of life, I think it's really up to the family and up to the child as to what, what is best for them. And, and if a child's not, I mean, there are children who just aren't happy at school. Some are mm -hmm. sad. They, they, they don't want to be that. I, my opinion, don't, they don't have to. And with the, it's it's about quality of life, and it's about what makes them happy, and it's not about getting those <laughs> scores or grades at at that point. It's it's about the socialization, it's about the relationships, and um, I know kids I've worked with have had really positive experiences at their schools where they're just loved on by their their peers, their <laughs> their teachers, and so to have a really loving, nurturing space like that is very helpful for any child. <laughs> <laughs> you should join our GHD sport. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any other questions or discussion they want to have about GHD before? Okay. Well, thank you all for being here. Is there anything online, Christine? No. Okay. Okay. Emails, though, for the yeah, yeah, yep. Yep, I will send that out. The It's just a handout of some some topics, some links to, to consider exploring further. Let's find some time digging into. And if you have any questions, there's numerous social workers through HDSA in, in the country spread out. If you call any of us, we're not gonna turn you away and say, no, call that person, and we might direct you to FER, but we'll, we help you out, so. I just thought of one more thing that yeah. a lot of the moms in our support group didn't realize, and that was, um, we were talking one time about like Autumn's IEP and the fact that we had changed it because she just had really bad mornings. Like, it, the, she goes to bed on time, she goes to bed really early sometimes, but for some reason she's just not an early, early morning person. And in high school, when she's in high school, if she was to ride the school bus, we move out of town, it's like a whole hour drive. We literally, have, she would have to get up at like 5.30 in the morning to go to school. That's early. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, thankfully, even with the IEP, it can be done where Autumn doesn't start school till second period, so it gives her more time to sleep in. Not only that, on top of it, she has her own school bus that comes just for her in the morning and drops her off in the afternoon right at our door. That is something that can be done to the IEP. And that has made, I mean, it's, it's, it might sound little, but it makes such a huge difference because there was, then she would be, you know, half dressed out the door because it's so early and then you got the school bus with all the kids looking off the bus waiting for autumn to come off the drive. Mm -hmm. So it was it's much less stressful for her now and just so people know that those things can be implemented into an IEP. Yeah, London was just mentioning that you can be really personalized and um, bring up requests and accommodations that um, are really specific to what the child needs, whether it's um, partial day, whether it's different accommodations for transportation. Um, just from my experience in the school district, we can make those accommodations, but we haven't been able to staff. Through COVID and with the staffing shortages, that has not always been an option. So that's the only holdback with some of our special needs students that do have those needs. Um, there are ways to get vans and alternative transportation for students that need that door-to-door, -door, um, but it depends on the staffing. So, no, no, and, and write it in, and so and they'll put a, they'll hire a, I'll put a posting out there and try to get someone, um, but that's been the challenge in some areas. Just so people know it's not, it is an option. And, it, and not only that, then I told the other moms in the group about that, and I think there was like three different ones that like, got, they had their IEP meetings, they got it changed, and they're like, oh, this is so great. I wish I would have done this sooner. <laughs> yeah, and there's partial days, there's ways to just really accommodate what your child needs and what's best for them, and, or to really focus on which classes they really enjoy. 
instead of sitting there for the eight hours a day, whether it maybe it's a partial day that really focuses on the jo the music class they like or the art class they enjoy. So, yeah, it can be very specialized. And there's a lot of schools out there. There's a lot of options nowadays. You can choose. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Feel free to reach out if there's any questions or any follow-up. I'd be happy to, if I don't know an answer, I know where I can find it. So thank you all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you.